Welcome everyone. We are just getting all of our attendees in, so please bear with us. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are excited to have you with us today. Uh, welcome to Let's Chat About, which is the free monthly webinar series hosted by Hope and Focus. We have developed the series with those living with LCA and IRDs in mind, but it is open to anyone who's interested in what's happening in our communities. My name is Courtney Coates. I am the Director of Outreach and Development for Hope and Focus. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series. They are AGTC, Dominion Energy, Editas Medicine, Janssen, Mira GTX, ProQR Therapeutics, and Spark Therapeutics. We could not provide programs such as these without their support. A few brief housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the session will last about 45 minutes. Your microphones have been muted and your cameras are off. You can submit questions through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom sidebar. And at this, as time allows, we'll take any questions that come in at the end live here. We are recording this session and after the webinar, we will post the recording to our YouTube channel and send you the link. It's my pleasure today to welcome Beth Borsowitz, Hope and Focus Board Director and Educational Consultant for the State of Connecticut, Department of Aging and Disability Services, with Bureau of Education Services for the Blind. Beth found her passion working with the blind and visually impaired community when three-year-old Sophia joined her preschool classroom. Beth now has more than 16 years of experience working with students across Connecticut. Beth is looking forward to talking about how to leverage the expanded core curriculum for independent living skills, supporting your child's transition to adulthood, and sharing best practices for self-advocacy in the classroom and beyond. Please join me in welcoming Beth. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Courtney. That, that, uh, that title is kind of a mouthful, so I apologize. <laughs> there, there should be more acronyms in there, I think. But, uh, <laughs> it is, but you know, we're so thankful to have you this morning. And with that title being said, can you explain a little bit about what you do and what your role is? Sure. So I um, an, am a teacher of students with visual impairments, and I work with children and families from uh, from as early as birth through age 22 um, or graduation from high school. Um, I work on um, not necessarily the core curriculum, which is like the math, the science, um, social studies, that sort of thing, but more access to the curriculum and um, helping to make your child more um, independent and, um, you know, as an adult. I can't hear you, Courtney. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. No worries. Um, what what does it look like on a day to day basis for your families with children who are age birth to three or a school age child with transitioning to a young adult? Sure. So it's, uh, you know, in my job, I kind of have to wear a lot of different hats. So um, with a family who has a, a child with a new diagnosis of a visual impairment, um, it it's really can be more of like a psychological situation, you know, it's, it's um, acceptance and, um, you know, it's a lot of sharing resources with families, um, you know, working with the birth to three coordinators, um, you know, figuring out what the goals are within the home and how we can inter, um, intermingle sort of, you know, visual tasks um, and skills to accomplish those goals. Um, for our school age um, sort of kiddos, again, it's that access to the curriculum. So if, um, a child is completely blind in their braille readers, it would be braille instruction. Um, if they were, the child is a large print reader, it would be access to um, 
getting large print books, our agency, we, we, um, we purchase those for school districts. Um, and just kind of a little, you know, um, I just want to put a little uh, disclaimer in there. You know, I'm speaking from the perspective of a teacher of the visually impaired from the state of Connecticut. Um, I know this, you know, a TBI's role can look kind of different from state to state, but um, for the most part, we kind of do the same thing. But I just want to make sure that everyone listening, some of the things that I'll be sharing is from a perspective of, from the state of Connecticut. Um, and we actually have our own agency where um, other states may not. Um, so just to kind of put that out there, not every state has um, their TBIs working with birth all the way through transition. That's just, that's just our model. Um, but going back to your question, sorry to kind of go off for a second. Um, but from when we're, then we actually help our students in transition as well. So whether that's into the workforce or into college, um, you know, working on like going to on a college visit, what does that mean? Going um, to speak to the, the college about um, accessibility for a student with a disability. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that we do. Um, and like I said, after where you have to like switch that hat, you know, from appointment to appointment during the day, but, um, but that's what makes us exciting. So it doesn't get boring at all. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that you get to really be with them throughout those true formative years. And it's not just those school years that really count. It's the before and the after. So uh, one of the topics we're looking at today is the expanded core curriculum. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it differs from the regular core curriculum? Sure. So as I mentioned before, the core curriculum is like your math, your science, language arts. Um, but the and that's what a regular education teacher would teach. And that's what they're responsible for educating your child with. Um, from a TVI's perspective, we work on skills like the expanded core curriculum. And there are nine areas um, that are skills that are specific for children with visual impairments that they may not gain um, the knowledge from incidentally as their sighted peers would. So um, there are, like I said, there's nine different areas um, and they each kind of, you know, focus on a different skill level. Um, and then they do go in and out, you know, for example, social skills can also um, work into recreation and leisure. So, um, I don't know, do you want me to kind of list them off, Courtney, and then I can kind of give you like a little example of each or yeah, would that work? Examples okay. would be amazing to see how okay. that kind of fits into their education. Sure. So again, in the state of Connecticut, at the end of every year, we submit a report to the regular ed team and we talk about what we've covered for this, the different areas of the expanded core curriculum. So um, the first one, and I may glance down because there's nine of them and I always forget one of them. It's like, it just always will. So um, compensatory skills is how your child or the student will access the curriculum. So I, I also want everyone, all the viewers to know that um, I'm, I don't just work with academic students um, that are visually impaired. I also work with students that are multiply impaired, that are nonverbal. So, you know, compensatory skills can look very different for all of the students that I work with. Um, so some students may be braille readers, some may be large print readers, some may be auditory learners, um, or even tactile learners. So it's, again, it's the access to the curriculum. Um, and then another category is orientation mobility. Um, and again, in the state of Connecticut is different. So in the state of Connecticut, we have TVIs and we also have orientation mobility specialists who are um, like, there's a special certification. Um, I know some states, they have TVIs slash o &M. So like if I worked in, I don't even know if this is correct, but in Virginia, for example, they may hire someone who is a TVI and an o &M with dual certification. That's not the way it is in Connecticut. We have TVIs and then we have orientation mobility. So um, orientation mobility is really kind of um, helping a child get around their environment in a safe manner. So whether that is using a cane um, or traveling on public transit, um, it can kind of, it, it could start very basic and it can go to, you know, flying independently. Um, I don't know, I see a question pop up, Courtney. Should I, should I answer it as, it as they come in? What would you suggest? I think we'll take the questions at the end. So I'll let okay. you wanna finish with the skills. 
Sure. So then, um, so that's orientation mobility, um, social interaction. So this is the third category and social interaction. It can be really difficult for um, a child with a visual impairment to make social connections. Um, you know, if they're a large print reader, they can maybe get some sort of facial recognition. However, they may not see emotions. So um, teaching a child how to have a conversation, reading the inflection in people's voices, you know, whether they're angry or if someone's yelling, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're upset. Um, it could be out of excitement. Um, you know, building sort of those communication skills with our students, how to know when, how to initiate a conversation, how to walk away from a conversation when you're done speaking. Um, so those are just some of the ideas. Um, independent living, this one's huge. So um, we all love our children. I have three children of my own. However, one day I would love to them be, to, to be independent and not be here. Um, I'd like to go visit them somewhere. So, um, so independent living skills, that can start at like the earliest of ages. You know, we can start with um, at home, just taking off their shoes when they're three years old and having a space for them to go back to. We don't want things magically appearing and disappearing, right? We wanna make sure that our kids are responsible for their things. Um, it could be, you know, giving little jobs around the house, um, you know, emptying the dishwasher or putting the dishes just in the sink when they're done, um, throwing away the napkins, anything like that, just to get your, your child responsible for what happens in their own environment. Um, recreation and leisure. Um, this is my most favorite. Um, so I, my undergrad, sorry, my nose is really itchy. I keep scratching my nose. Um, recreation and leisure is, my undergrad actually is, rec is community recreation. So my father always said, oh, you're really good at playing with other people. So, um, so I do, I have a degree in play, but, um, but recreation and leisure can be, um, you know, doing modified sports or it could be adapting an existing sport um, for a child. It doesn't have to be a sport. It could be reading. Um, we hope and focus. We hosted our own um, our book club. We had a bunch of young readers, and they were all super excited. And they all that was their leisure activity. So we got a group of kids together, um, which again brings in the social skills too, right? So it, these kind of you'll see kind of a pattern here. Um, sensory efficiency. This is kind of. Um, it's only for children in the US. So, um, sorry, I keep reading the questions that pop up. Um, so sensory efficiency is basically, you know, working with a student to utilize if they have some residual vision um, or, you know, working on listening skills, exploring their other senses to, to, to you know, I'm trying to think of the word, to experience their environment. So whether that's tactile or whether that's, um, auditory or, like I said, using the residual vision. Um, the next one's assistive technology. Um, th so this could be the instruction of it. So like teaching a screen reader um, or a braille note touch or something, or it could also be um, depending on a child's level of vision or blindness. Um, it could be just something like keyboarding skills. Um, so assistive technology, um, is great, but it you have to kind of know the maturity level of your student before you just start throwing different devices at them. Um, the next one is career education. And, you know, my kids, I, I, I do not have any, uh, my personal children are not visually impaired, but they're very curious about, um, you know, what people in our community, what their jobs are. And they get that when we go to the grocery store, they know that there's someone who works at the grocery store. We go to the post office, we know, they know that there's a postman. Um, the police officers, you know, they hear the sound and they, my kids know that that's a, a police officer. So kids that have no vision or low vision may not make those connections. So starting those connections early, just talking about what you do for a job and you're like, as a parent, um, is helpful. You know, mom and dad, we go to work every day. What, what is your job? What do you do? Um, what is the purpose of that? So that way it kind of, at a young age, your children are starting to be like, oh, maybe I want to do that, what mom does. And like, what skills would I need to do that? So just having, you know, round the table conversations um, about jobs is, is a great way to start. Um, and the last one I say for the last um, is self-determination. So this is like my most favorite. And you have, a, you know, it's probably the most important as well. You know, self-determination, if 
basically is, you know, our child speaking up for themselves, our child, um, you know, knowing, believing in themselves, knowing that they can do something. Um, I get a little emotional about this because my whole joke with all of my students is my job is to work myself out of a job. Um, you know, I really want them to be the ones when they're in high school to, to, you know, say to a teacher, like, I need this, or you're, you're not giving this to me and I need this because. So um, that's probably, that's my, my most favorite. Yeah, I know we titled today's session um, self-advocacy, but I think, you know, that that theme of self-determination is really powerful, as you've stated, and it's really what helps people keep going. Um, can you expand on that and how exactly do you work with students to teach that? Sure. So like I said, it's really kind of just teaching a child to believe in themselves, you know, to take that leap, um, whether that's, you know, crossing an intersection for the first time using their cane, you know, taking that step off the curb can be, you know, really scary or, you know, going up to a friend or sitting at a, a lunch table and trying to initiate a conversation. So it's the little things like that um, that build confidence. Um, so like, you know, my, some of my students, when they hit middle school age, um, we like to create a vision statement. So um, it's basically a, the student writes out, um, you know, what tools they use to access the curriculum, whether that's any assistive technology, um, anything like that, the needs that they'll have in the classroom from the teacher, and, you know, maybe if there's a mobility situation, if they use a cane, that would be listed in there. And then it's, you know, things they need from a teacher to be successful or what they need in their school environment to be successful. So, um, and it's really powerful when a, a student can sit in their own IEP meeting and deliver to the team from their perspective. You know, adults, they sit around all the time and they, oh, this is what's best for the child and this is whatever. But for the student to say, no, this is what I need and why I need it at an early age and building those skills will just make them so much more successful, um, you know, as they become adults. Um, I hope I answered that, Courtney, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's a really important part of all of this because, you know, while you're there to be a consultant, it is a relationship between both of you. Um, I know you've given us some resources that we can share with everyone today. So I'm going to drop a link to that in the chat. But if you could just sure. kind of go over what some of those resources look like for everyone. Sure. So um, I, I, there's some that I really enjoy. Um, and I actually, I follow. So I get um, some like notifications. And as a family, you could even um, subscribe for them as well. Um, but some of the websites I really like, and I'm just going to glance down so that I, I make sure I don't miss any. Um, the ECC and me. So it's a website that, um, so there's a, it's a website. So um, it kind of gives ideas on different parts of the expanded core curriculum, how to integrate them. It's more of, it's more kind of geared towards TVIs, um, but it's something that you could totally integrate at home. Um, you know, you can kind of, I, I know the summer months, a lot of us like to just kind of like chill out and not, you know, just kind of not think about school, especially kids. Um, but, you know, they're really easy little things that you could kind of integrate into the day, into your week. Um, another great resource, very similar, is called Nine More Than Core, which we kind of went through all of those just now. There are nine topics in the ECC, and they are in addition to your core curriculum. Um, there's a blog called The Independent Little Bee, um, and it kind of talks about different ways for your child to be independent, again, in school, at home, in the community. Um, expanded core curriculum ideas for preschoolers and early elementary. This is actually a little, like, a little bragging thing, Courtney, but um, not really. I'm really not that kind of person. But I actually, um, during the, co when COVID hit, it was the summer of 2020. And we were looking for some sort of um, ideas for families to do with their children because we couldn't do any summer camps. Um, so I put together, it was like a, 
uh, an expanded core curriculum expedition. So if you click on that one, it's um, like a little passport and your child can put stamps or stickers in it. And every time they do something that covers one of the areas of the expanded core curriculum, they get a stamp in their passport. So there's just little activities like, um, you know, during bath time, like talking about independent living skills, like, you know, washing, that sort of thing, you know, using a hand under hand approach which, and again, I'm kind of going off on another tangent here, Courtney, so I apologize, but um, it's also really important um, that when you're working with, even with your own child, um, that you approach instruction or anything kind of like a hand under hand model. So um, your child, you know, they're still in control. So like if it's something tactual or something you want them to explore, it's sort of modeling that for them, but they're still in control to pull their hand away. So, you know, a lot of teachers, this is like my biggest pet peeve when I go into schools is they'll grab a child with a visual impairment's hand and like put their hand in things. It's like, no, 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 no. Like if you do hand under hand, you're actually introducing and showing them how to interact. And then they have that freedom to pull back. Um, and again, I totally went off on a tangent, but as you can tell, I love what I do. Um, so <laughs> there's another link. It's called, is my child getting a quality visual impairment program or a VI program? Um, again, every state is different. And um, I don't even know if we have any viewers from outside of the United States, but I'm sure other countries are different as well. But um, this kind of just talks about the basics of what a TVI or a visually impaired a teacher of the visually impaired um, should be providing for your child. And if they aren't, it's a great resource to use to advocate for your child. So in a PPT, or we call them PPT meetings in Connecticut, so an IEP meeting, um, you know, the parent can call one at any time. Um, and if you feel like you're not, your child's not getting the support of what they need, you can ask for it. Ask away. Like they're, the difficult thing about, and I'm not, a, again, I keep saying this, I'm not a parent of a child with a visual impairment, but the most difficult thing of being a parent with a child of any disability is just not knowing. It is, you're, you're sometimes kind of on an island unto yourself, especially with a visual impairment, because it's such a low incident disability. So, um, and then you add on that, it being even a, a rare disease, such as some of our viewers have their children, um, you know, you're kind of like, you're, you're, audience is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, you know, a lot of times when I go into a district, um, because, because I'm state, I don't, I'm not just in one district, I have like a region. Um, sometimes some districts I go into and it's the first child with a visual impairment they've ever had. So they need you as a parent to be like, no, we really need orientation mobility. No, we really need this. No, you know, where do we get large print books? So, you know, for you, you need to be like the biggest advocate for your child. So that, that resource is a really great one. Um, so those that have um, younger children and might not be familiar to the process yet, can you explain a little bit more what PPT or IEP, sure. um, what those stand for? So PPT, sorry, is, a, I don't know if it's a Connecticut thing, but um, it's a parent professional team meeting. So um, it's, I think in Massachusetts, they call it an IEP meeting. I'm not really sure, but basically you create an IEP, which is an individualized education plan. And the IEP follows the child. So right when they become school age, so if they start in preschool, it would be three right until transition, whether that's 18 at graduation or 22 through a transition program. Um, and it, it, it's exactly what it is. It's an individualized education program. So um, if a child needs braille instruction, that would be written in there and there would be specific goals for accomplishing those. So, um, and then if your child has additional disabilities, if they have an um, occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech and language therapist, they also would be, their service hours would be listed in there. Um, some children whose disability is, they only have the single disability of a visual impairment, um, and maybe they're a large print reader, they may go, they may only have a 504 plan. So a 504 plan is very, it's, it's kind of like a step below an IEP. There aren't any goals associated, but there can be modifications or, um, you know, environmental adaptations kind of can be built into that. Um, so that's kind of like the, 
cliff notes of an IEP 504 PBT. Um, and if anyone has questions, you know, please feel free. Um, and then the next two are Family Connect and Wonder Baby. Those are really great for just family resources. Um, and the last one is my blog. So I actually, um, I started writing, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Um, and it's really like the games and stuff that I used with one of my young Braille readers um, to kind of get her, keep her interested in Braille. Um, and then there's some other things in there about the expanded core curriculum. There were some trips that we've taken um, with some of the kids in, in the state of Connecticut. Um, I think there's, there may even be a reference to Sophia in one of those or two, one or two she inspired. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those are, those just are kind of like a quick little, you know, explanation of some of those, those resources, but, but definitely check it out. They're really great. Yeah, we're so thankful that you were able to put those together for us. We do have some non-US um, people with us today, as well as I'm oh, sure great. we'll be viewing this in the future. Um, would you be able to identify there what are good resources that they can use out of that list, as well as, you know, is there anything that would translate to outside of the US? I think um, I think all of them should translate to outside of the US. I kind of tried to keep them as, um, I don't want to say basic, but very, um, you know, you can Google anything and it's like this deep, dark dive, right? Like you just kind of lose days, like just going through stuff, especially when you have a child with a new diagnosis. Um, I have to say the biggest resource or the best resource is other families, um, you know, making those connections with people that have have already gone through a diagnosis of a rare disease or, you know, a visual impairment for their young child, or even an adult, you know, try to find mentors within your community. Um, if you, there is an agency um, like ours for services for the blind in your state, you know, reach out to them. Um, but really, again, it's, it's the people that have already gone through it that will be able to guide you the best. So that's what is so great about Hope and Focus. And, um, you know, it's, it's really family oriented as well as research based. So there's, there's just like this, there's, that's why, I mean, that's why I'm on the board. I, I love it. I'm, I'm super passionate about it. And, um, and what, you know, Hope and Focus does for families is, it's like immeasurable. So um, just making those connections and sharing experiences because one family may have something that they were trying that another family was like, I didn't even think of that. So, um, you know. And here at Hope and Focus, we do have our family connections program. So if anyone's listening and hasn't participated in that program yet, um, it is available on our website and we can connect families to one another, um, whether you would like to be connected to someone in your area or someone with a similar gene. Um, either way, we can make sure you get connected with those resources. So I'm glad that you brought that up, Beth. Sure. So I think at this point, um, we would love to take some questions from the audience. I know a couple came in while we were talking. So sure. I'm going to go back. Um, the first one that came in um, was, how do you know if your child needs Braille or a large print? That's a great question. So a TVI will typically do what's called a learning media assessment. So here's another acronym for you if you're writing it down. It's called an LMA. So um, so in the learning media assessment, it's actually part of another acronym, a functional vision assessment. So that is something, a functional vision assessment is something that a TVI also does. Um, and it's updated yearly. And it's just, it. you know, when a, when a child gets... Um, goes to the eye doctor and they get an acuity, like 2020 is perfect, right? So if they're 2100 or 2150, they're, um, that's in like the most perfect setting, right? Like it's in a dark room with a backlit screen. So a functional vision assessment is the TVI goes in and sees how a child's using their vision in a typical school or a learning environment. So there's overhead lights, there's natural light, there's glare on the board. So those are kind of all intermingled. Um, that's one piece of the puzzle. The learning media assessment is, um, you know, if a child's low vision, um, or you're kind of on that, I'm not sure if they'll be braille or a large print reader. Um, there's parts of that learning media assessment, you know, talk, having a child read a certain amount of uh, size font, um, from what distance, 
from how long can they do that? Um, you know, we want to consider things like visual fatigue. Um, if it's functional, like, you know, if a child's reading, you know, the font that they can read is like 72 point font, that's not very functional, right? So, you know, if they're reading a page, they're only going to get like two words on a page. Um, so those are kinds of the things that we, we take into consideration before we uh, recommend Braille to a family. Um, it's also family choice. So if a, a family, you guys have a, a huge piece of this. Um, so some families may think um, that their child is a, a large print reader, which is fine. But for some families with students or children that have LCA, for example, um, or Leavers, um, they it's a degenerative eye condition. So as a TVI, we take that into consideration as well. So if a child um, is has a degenerative eye condition and right now they're reading, you know, 22 point font in kindergarten, does it make sense if they're projected to lose their vision by high school to, to learn Braille early? Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a team decision. And again, that's where those that IEP meeting comes in. Um, so long, long way around, Courtney. It's um, it's kind of you know a bunch of assessments um, and seeing what's right for the child. Some some students, some children are really tactile defensive. So introducing a tactile medium, um, it might not be it might not work. Um, so it, there's just a lot of things that we kind of take into consideration, I guess. So hopefully, I answered that question. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so the next one is on the expanded core curriculum, as we talked about, is that something that's only for children in the U.S. or has it been seen abroad as well? No, I'm, I'm, it's pretty universal. Um, it's basically, it's, it's our framework as TVIs. Um, that's what we work from. That's what we work towards. Um, so I've, I would love to travel outside of the United States to be able to give you a 100 percent act. But as far as I know, it's, it's pretty universal. Great. Okay, next one. Uh, when it comes to teaching basic safety or stranger danger, how do we help our kids manage this? Is this something in the resources that you provide? Um, I don't know if it is. That's actually a really good question. But, um, you know, teaching a child with a visual impairment is just like teaching a typically sighted child. So um, when it comes to things like that, stranger danger, that sort of thing, um, it's probably, you know, the most difficult thing, I think, is, you know, a lot of our kids with visual impairments in schools, there's a lot of adults around them all the time. There's a lot of support there. So, um, you know, I guess I never really thought about this from a stranger danger perspective. This is kind of something that I'm going to have to take a deeper dive into. But um, it's never really come up, I guess, for my, any of my students. But it could be one of those in one of those resources. If not, I'd be happy to do some research and, and share it if that can be shared afterwards, Courtney. Um, the cool thing about working in Connecticut is I'm one of, I think there's 35 of us, 35 TVIs in the state. So every once in a while I'll have a question like this and I'll just like shoot it out to the group. So um, hopefully someone else has experienced it. But, but I would think it would be just as typical as you would um, with a sighted child. You know, my biggest thing is um, with my with the students that I work with is if they're walking down the hallway in a school, they're like a celebrity, right? Like a lot of our little ones, they're celebrities like, oh, here comes so and so. And you know, let's say hi and let's stop. But, you know, my biggest thing is for my students. And again, Courtney, I'm going off on a tangent. But when they're walking down the hall and they're using their cane, they're working. So like, you know, our kids are working when they're using their cane. They're, that's a mobility lesson that they're, you know, even if they're just going from one place to another. So I really like to encourage, because schools are safe, right? Like we like to think our schools, it's a safe learning environment for our kids. But nowhere else in anywhere will your child be walking down the street and someone just be like, you know, a stranger come up and just be like, oh, because oh, 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 there's usually an adult there. Um, so I like to say to to schools and people that work with, uh, you know, our students with visual impairments, you know, if you don't say hi to every single kid in the, the hallway, don't single out the child with the cane. Don't single out the child with the visual impairment because they don't know. They don't make those connections. And if they are saying hello, make sure you say, 
hi, Courtney, it's Miss Beth. How are you today? And, you know, make that connection instead of, you know, being on the street, which actually I have seen this before. Um, we, we've been on a, a field trip and someone has said, oh, hey, Johnny, you know, it's, do you, do you know who this is? Like playing guessing games is not, that's not cool. So, I mean, you know, maybe giving, giving some script to your child on if someone comes up to them and they don't know who they are, like, I'm sorry, I don't remember who you are. Um, you know, giving them that, that script. Um, I don't know. You got me thinking. I'm going to have to look into that. Great. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, but if anyone has questions, please um, drop them in the chat or the Q&A now so that we can make sure we get that um, to Beth so that she can answer them with us. Um, is there any kind of like last advice that you'd like to give? I know a lot of the people are probably parents and, you know, have kids in school and um, just some words of hope around that support system that's there. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, like I said, I love what I do. I, I mean, I, I wish everyone would do what I do. Um, and when there is a shortage, so if anyone's interested, please, you know, there's like a state, like worldwide shortage of TVIs. Um, but, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, for your kids, set expectations high, you know, they can do anything, they, they really can do anything they've set their mind to. And, you know, any way you can support them to be independent or to explore something new um, is really, it's empowering for them. So, you know, I, I really encourage you to, you know, I know it's a lot easier to just tie their shoes or to, you know, put their coat on or zip it up. But like, you know, that's great when they're five or six, but when they're 22 and they still can't do those things, like that's just, that's, you know, you're not helping them. So, you know, challenge your kids every day, um, you know, give them a safe place to learn. And, you know, like I said before, like my job, I always say to my kids is like, my job is to work myself out of a job. And, you know, I get a little emotional when I say that, but, um, but really like it, it really is. So, and it's exciting to see them do those things. So celebrate everything, celebrate every little thing. Those are some fantastic words. We had a couple more questions come in uh, while you were speaking. Uh, one of the parents wants to know, do they need to learn Braille? As so, a parent? so I love Braille. Like, I think Braille is so cool. Like it really, it really is, but it's not easy. It's not, it's not something like you just pick it up as a hobby. Like it's something that, um, and that's why we don't teach our, some of our students just, you know, we just want to have Braille just in case. Like, no, if we're going to teach you Braille, we're going to make it functional and it's going to be in the classroom. From a parent perspective, I always think it's cool to do or to show an interest in what your kids are doing. Um, so even if you just learn the alphabet, which in itself is just like you're showing any interest, it's fun to like write little, you know, secret notes to your your child like your other kids don't know, right? Like, oh, you've got this like secret code that you can go back and forth. I don't think you need to know the entire code. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's time consuming, but, um, but to me, I love Braille. So if anyone wants to learn Braille, I say go for it. Um, but again, you're supporting your child. So it would be the same thing as if your child wants to play baseball, right? And they're like, oh, can you go throw in the yard with me? Like, I want you to show interest in my baseball, like, you know, show a little interest in Braille or anything like that. Um, so I say yes. I'm always a yeser for Braille. So, so go for it. So um, parents and sighted kids uh, read Braille visually correct or do they use their hands? So I do not read it tactually either. So you would read it visually. So, um, so what happens is there's when a child first starts learning Braille, they're using a traditional Perkins Brailler, which, you know, it's, I don't know if you've, if you have one at home, you'll know what I'm talking about, but it's very like archaic looking, right? So it's, you know, the kids are pushing down on this and the, the dots come up um, and you do, you, what we would say interline. So like you would read it visually and then we would write above for, um, for teachers to be able to read or for you guys, for a parent to read. Um, as your child progresses and they have some of this assistive technology that I kind of glanced over real quick, like a Braille note, um, it's really cool because the, the, your child can input Braille, but then they can print it off in print. So you wouldn't even have to read it um, in Braille. So that's kind of why I was like, I think Braille is super cool when kids are younger. Um, if your child's already in like middle school, high school, um, 
learning the technology, I think would be even more exciting. So, um, so yeah, I hope again, Courtney, I keep like, feel like I'd go off on these. No, I mean, it's all really relevant tangents. information. Um, we have another question that says, can the child continue as an inclusive student from their first class? If the TBI says that they need to continue with Braille, I don't know which age is best to start learning Braille. So depending on the age, so, so I like to teach Braille if the, if the opportunity is there, um, right alongside sighted peers. So if they're in kindergarten and they're learning their A, you know, A is this, A, B is that, whatever, you know, I'd like to have a Braille reader right, working right along with that. Um, and I, I think the first, the first question, Courtney, was something about the inclusive classroom. Is that right? Yeah. Can they so, an inclusive student? So, yeah. So, um, and I, 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 if she heard me say this, she would probably yell at me, but I'm going to use Sophia as an example, because I actually started working with Sophia when she was, she was actually three when we started working together, but um, she learned, started learning Braille in kindergarten. Um, and she was fully inclusive. Um, she used her brailler in the classroom. Um, usually, so again, I'm speaking from the perspective of Connecticut. Um, a young braille reader will have a one-on-one -on -one or a braille transcriptionist. So a paraprofessional that would work with them all the time who would be in the classroom with the student and um, really support them with the braille or um, you know the the creation of materials and that sort of thing making things accessible um, I don't see why a child couldn't be fully inclusive I mean all of the students I've ever worked with um, that are braille readers were fully inclusive um, some things might take a little longer to produce or um, you know, they may not be right at the same level as their peers all the way through. They might be a little bit of a step behind, um, but there's no reason why they shouldn't be fully inclusive. And again, I'm speaking from the perspective of Connecticut. So um, it's really, oh, no, I see, I see something. Oh, someone said about from country, another country, yeah, but, um, that's the but yes, behind it. They so yeah, so that's kind of my thought. So it's really easy for me to say what happens in Connecticut because this is what I live every day. Um, I would have to know, I mean, it's kind of hard to just give an answer without knowing the context. Like, you know, is, is visual impairment the, the child's only exceptionality? Like, do they have other um, disabilities on top of that? Um, is there mobility issues? Like, you know, there's other kind of things that we have to think about from a, an inclusive, a fully inclusive perspective. Um, but to be included in the majority of their day in a regular classroom, I don't see, I don't see why that couldn't happen. And again, as a parent, that's something you can advocate for, whether you're in the United States or in another country. So ask for it. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, this theme of making sure to advocate and the self-determination on the student side, I think all of that works hand in hand to make, you know, a really well-rounded experience for everyone. So thank you, Beth. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat at this point, but um, we really appreciate all that you've um, explained for us today. And, you know, this recording will be available later. Um, our next Let's Chat About will take place on March 24th at 1 p.m. And that will be with Ben Yerksa talking about Opus Genetics and their new efforts. Um, so we're really excited for that conversation. And if you'd like to sign up, the link is in the chat now for you. And then lastly, um, if you're not currently receiving our Seeing Hope newsletter, um, it is a mailed publication that we do quarterly. Um, please be sure to sign up for that. Um, we'll mail it to any country um, as long as we have your address. It does go international. So please take a moment and look at our past issues and sign up at the link that will be provided in the chat. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Beth. That was amazing. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. So great information. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks so much. Bye. -bye.